I appreciate you joining us for this time of Bible study, and I'm praying that our time together in God's Word will be a help to you in your spiritual growth. Let me encourage you to contact me. If you ever have any questions or comments about our study time together, uh, you can send me an email or call the church office, and that information is on our website, hopebiblechurchga.com. Let me encourage you to visit that website. We have archives of Bible study time under resources. Click on video. It'll take you to our YouTube channel. Uh, this is our 18th study in a series of studies, and there's an order to what we're teaching. And so if you've missed uh, previous broadcasts, you can go back and check out the archives. And also there's other study material available on the website. Also on the website, you'll find uh, information about our church here in Locust Grove, uh, directions to our property, service times, ministries, statement of faith, and so on. We'd love for you to visit us at Hope Bible Church. We're located on Tanger Boulevard. Uh, we're a friendly church. We love to have visitors. I hope you'll come out and see us sometime soon um, at Hope Bible Church. Also, the chart you see behind me, we have smaller sizes of these charts that we can mail to you if you'd like a copy. And we've mailed out a number of them already. We have some left. If you, if you would like your own copy of the study chart, we'd be glad to send it to you uh, free of charge. Just let us know your address, and we'll get that to you as soon as possible. Uh, the chart is not a, you know, perfect chart. The, only the Bible is perfect. But I think it's helpful. There, there are scripture references on there. And it's helpful to give you an overview of the Bible, the timeline of the Bible, understanding the different dispensations revealed in the Bible. And so it's a, I think it's a helpful tool in rightly dividing the word of truth. So if you like your own copy, just let us know. Now, we call this Bible study time because we are studying the word of God. And not only am I teaching the Bible on this program, but my, my goal is to help you learn how to study the Bible for yourself. We grow far better uh, spiritually when we get in the Bible for ourselves. It's a blessing to have teachers to help us, but we'll learn far more and we'll go forward in our spiritual growth uh, much better with personal Bible study. The Bible said, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So this is a personal thing, thyself. We need to study to show our, ourself personally approved unto God. Take it seriously. Take it personally and get in the Bible for yourself. And uh, we want to be a help to you, but we, like we always say, check everything with the Word of God. Uh, the Bible is the authority, not me or any other preacher or teacher. The Bible itself, the King James Bible, is the authority in all matters of faith and practice because it is the uh, inspired and preserved Word of God. Now, we have... Um, We've come to the point now in our study where we're emphasizing the need to rightly divide the word of truth. We started off talking about the fact that, um, you know, you can't really study and understand the Bible unless you first of all know the Lord. You must be saved. Uh, the Bible's a spiritual book that's spiritually discerned. The Spirit of God must illuminate your understanding to the spiritual truth of the word. And so we spent the first couple lessons talking about salvation and how that it's by grace through faith and that Christ died on the cross for our sins, and he died for all of our sins and paid the price in full. And he was buried three days and nights, but rose again in victory the third day. And so the gospel by which we're saved, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, is that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried. He rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Now what we must simply do is believe on him, trust in him, and um, it's not by any works that we can do. The question is, what are you really trusting? See, there are a lot of people out there, they believe in God, and, and they even believe Jesus died on the cross. But in their heart, they're trusting their church membership. They're trusting their baptism. They're trusting something they've done. Uh, you're not saved until you trust what Christ already did, and he paid it all. And he, his salvation is perfect and complete. You can't add anything to it. Just receive it by grace through faith. Uh, and the moment you're saved, you get all the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God, He indwells you. He regenerates you. He baptizes you into Christ. He seals you. Uh, he's there, but you must learn to walk by faith in God's Word for Him to illuminate uh, your understanding. So the second key we talked about was believing the book. you got to believe the Bible. If you don't believe the Bible, you know, 
unbelief is sin. And um, the Bible said, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. The Bible says, without faith it's impossible to please him. And so you got to be a Bible believer. You believe the Word of God, and the Spirit of God will open your understanding as you study the Word of God. We talked about the fact we got a perfect Bible in our language, the English language, in the King James Bible. We spent some time on that. But now for the bulk of our study, uh, we've been going through rightly dividing the Word of Truth, 2 Timothy uh, chapter 2, verse 15. We've emphasized the fact that all Scripture is for us. I mean, 2 Timothy 3, 16 says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And so all Scripture is for us. Yet, before Paul said that in 2 Timothy 3, 16, he said in chapter 2, verse 15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And so we've been talking about what it means to rightly divide the word of truth. All scriptures for us, but it's not all written to us. It's not all about us. We've got to acknowledge the differences in the word of God, the different ages, the different dispensations. God doesn't change in his person. He doesn't change in his moral principles. But he does change in his dealings with men. And the Bible was given by a progressive revelation. And as God reveals more truth, um, things change in his dealings with men. Now, the Bible is complete. Nothing else. I mean, it's all exactly what, what God wants it to be. It's a closed canon. It's a complete book. There's no new revelation being given. We got the 66 books, the perfect revelation. But as you study those 66 books, you see things progressively being revealed and as a result, things are changing in God's dealings with men. So while all Scripture is profitable uh, for our study because it is all given by inspiration of God, it can be rendered unprofitable, in fact, even hurtful if we fail to study the God-given key of rightly dividing the word of truth. And the one verse where God said to study he told you exactly how to do it. He told you that your motive needs to be to be approved unto him, not man, not the fear of man, but the fear of God. Uh, seeking to be approved unto him, studying the Bible his way, believing his book and studying it his way. God has put some divisions in his word, and rightly dividing is acknowledging those divisions. Um, rightly dividing the Bible is not an issue of dividing truth from error, because all the Bible is the word of truth. Uh, of course, as we learn the truth, we, we'll be able to discern truth from error. But the issue of rightly dividing the word of truth is, is knowing that there are divisions in the word of truth itself, so that, for an example, what may be truth for Israel under the law is not truth for us to follow as the body of Christ under grace. And so we need to understand that. Well, we've, so far we've talked about the basics of right division. We've talked about the main division in the Bible being between uh, prophecy and mystery. Uh, we've talked about the twofold purpose of God that goes along with that main division, his purpose for the earth, his purpose for the heaven, his purpose for the earth was spoken by the prophet since the world began, his purpose for the heaven was kept secret till it was revealed to Paul. We've dealt with the dispensational layout of the books of the Bible. We took a brief overview um, of God's purpose and plan for the nation Israel as well as for the body of Christ. In this study, we're going to consider two distinct ministries of Christ. Now there's only one Jesus Christ, but there's a difference between his earthly ministry and his heavenly ministry. Look in Romans chapter 15, and let's start by contrasting two verses in this chapter. Romans chapter 15, and notice what Paul said in verse 8, and then we'll go down to verse 16. Um, Romans 15, 8. Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. And that would be uh, the Hebrew fathers. He's, the circumcision is talking about the Jews. So in his earthly ministry, well, Christ himself said, I'm not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. All right, now in verse 16, Paul said that I... Well, let's read verse 15. Nevertheless, brethren, I have written the more boldly unto you in some sort as putting you in mind because of the grace that is given to me of God. And Paul emphasized how by the grace of God he was made to be something. He was made a minister. He was given an apostleship. 
He was given revelations. He said that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. You see the difference there? Christ in his earthly ministry, a minister of the circumcision. Paul, well, Christ was working through him to be the minister to the Gentiles. He said, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. So a simple comparison and contrast of Romans 15, 8 with verse 16 will help us immensely in understanding the Bible if we will believe what they clearly say. There's a difference between the earthly ministry of Christ and his heavenly ministry through Paul. I say his heavenly ministry because Paul was just a vessel. Uh, what he preached, he got directly from the Lord. When he wrote 13 books of the Bible, it was by inspiration of God. It was Christ working through him. So we're not magnifying Paul's a man. He's nothing without the Lord. But the Lord chose him and the Lord used him. And there's a difference between his ministry to Israel while on earth and his ministry to the body of Christ from heaven through the Apostle Paul. It's so imperative to understand that the earthly ministry of Christ was one of confirmation, not inauguration. Confirmation means he came to confirm what was already promised, what was already prophesied. Everything Jesus did in his earthly ministry was in accordance with what had already been spoken by the prophets. He did not come to reveal a new purpose. Now, he did reveal some new things about the old purpose, about what was already revealed. He talked about the mysteries of the kingdom, and those were some secret things about the kingdom, but the kingdom is still prophesied. Now, inauguration has to do with revealing something or, or beginning something, uh, initiating something, and Christ inaugurated the present dispensation from heaven not on earth. He began this dispensation from heaven when he revealed it through his chosen vessel, his appointed spokesman and pattern for this age, the Apostle Paul. Now, Ephesians 3 makes that crystal clear. In Ephesians 3, Paul said, If you've heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which has given me to you Gentiles, he said how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, and that mystery is the body of Christ. The body of Christ is one spiritual new man. It's neither Jew nor Gentile. All believers, doesn't matter if you're Jew or Gentile, when you believe the gospel, the grace of God, you're baptized by one spirit and one body, and that body has a heavenly position and a heavenly hope. That is different. That was not made known in the earthly ministry of Christ. Uh, that was something secret that was revealed. The word mystery in the Bible doesn't mean something you can't know. It means something that was secret, but God has revealed. Now, Israel's is God's earthly people. He promised them a land and a worldwide kingdom over the nations. And um, Christ plainly said that he was not sent, but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Matthew 15, 24, he, uh, for an example, where he made that statement. It's not that he didn't care about the Gentiles. It's just that according to prophecy, uh, the Gentiles were to be blessed through Israel's rise in instrumentality. Stop over in Matthew 15, and then we're going to go to Isaiah 62. If you'll get those two passages, let's stop. I, I referred to what he said in Matthew 15. Let's read that, and then we're going to go back to Isaiah chapter 62. In Matthew 15 beginning in verse number 21. Then Jesus went thence and departed into the coast of Tyre and Sidon, and behold, a woman of Canaan. So this is not a Jew. Uh, she's a Gentile. A woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. For my, he, She said, My daughter is grievously vexed with a devil. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, Now listen to this. It is not meet to take the children's bread 
and cast it to the dogs. He's distinguishing between the children of the kingdom. Israel is going to be the head of nations. They're going to be above the nations. And the Gentiles are the dogs. He said, I'm not going to take the children's bread and cast it to the dogs. Now, what he meant by that was in his earthly ministry, he was there to preach unto Israel. And once Israel was saved, then they would be a kingdom of priests to the Gentile nations. But he wasn't about to break his own uh, principle there of what was prophesied and the way he would do things. And she said, Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. So she humbled herself and acknowledged that the Gentiles had a lesser place. They were not uh, on the same level, so to speak, as far as what God gave to Israel to be the head over the nations. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. See, what she said there was in accordance with the word of God. Be it unto thee as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. See, Gentiles are going to be saved under the kingdom program, but they're saved through Israel. When she acknowledged, when she acknowledged that, Jesus said salvations of the Jews in John 4. When she acknowledged that, he made it an exception in his earthly ministry. He only blessed a couple Gentiles according to the record, and they were both Gentiles who were a blessing to the Jews and acknowledged their place. Look in Isaiah 62. Again, this is not saying that he doesn't care about the world. We know he's the Savior of the world. But according to prophecy, Israel must be blessed first. Then they teach all nations. They reach the nations. They're a kingdom of priests to the nations. There's an order. Isaiah 62, verse 1, For Zion's sake will I not hold my peace, and for Jerusalem's sake I'll not rest, until the righteousness thereof go forth as brightness, and the salvation thereof as a lamp that burneth. And the Gentiles shall see thy righteousness, and all kings thy Glory, and thou shalt be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord shall name. Thou shalt also be a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord, and a royal diadem in the hand of thy God. The Gentiles will see uh, that glory and that brightness. Christ on the throne of David in Jerusalem, Israel a kingdom of priests. It, uh, the Gentiles come to God through Israel. That's the point. And, of course, there's a lot of verses we can show you in prophecy along those lines. But you know what God promised Abraham? He said, I'll bless them that bless thee, and I'll curse him that curseth thee. So Israel does have an advantage there in that prophesied program. But in this present age, the age of grace, uh, it's different. As revealed through Paul's ministry, the Gentiles are blessed through the fall and diminishing of Israel. Look in Romans 11. Romans chapter 11, and, and uh, notice in verse number 12. Now if the fall of them, talking about Israel, be the riches of the world, and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. For I speak to you Gentiles, and as much as I'm the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. Now, that's very clear. He said, I am the apostle to the Gentiles. I magnify mine office. Uh, it's not magnifying Paul as a man, not at all, but it's the office Christ gave him, understanding the importance of that. He said in verse 15, For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? So God's not finished with Israel. Israel fell. They've been diminished, but he will yet save that nation in the future. But in this age... The Gentiles are blessed without Israel. We're blessed through the fall of Israel. Uh, we're blessed through the diminishing. So that's a very important distinction. Believing Jews and Gentiles, uh, when they believe the gospel of the grace of God, they're baptized into one spiritual body, no earthly distinctions. In Galatians chapter 3, in Galatians chapter 3, verse 27, the Word of God says in Galatians 3, Verse 27, for as many as of you have been baptized, that's not with water, not at all. I'm talking about the Holy Spirit, baptized into Christ. The Spirit of God baptizes believers into Christ upon salvation. 
He said, you've put on Christ. Well, water can't put you in Christ. That's ridiculous. That's not at all what he's talking about. He said in verse 28, there's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither bond nor free. There's neither male nor female. When people get baptized in water, uh, if they go in a male, they come out a male. If they go in a female, they come out a female. This is a, this is a spiritual thing. He's saying in Christ, you have the same spiritual standing. This is a spiritual baptism. He said, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. Water can't do that. It's the Spirit of God that does that. And so what a difference in this age. Now the question is, when did Israel fall? When? You know, most think it was when they crucified Christ. They said, we'll not have this man to reign over us. And they said, crucify him. The scripture says he came unto his own and his own received him not. And most people think, well, that was it. At the cross, God was finished with them. And now ever since the cross, he's been building the body of Christ. Well, after the cross, they were given an opportunity to repent. As recorded in the book, the book of Acts, on the cross, Luke 23, verse 34, the Lord Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Uh, they, in ignorance, killed their own Messiah. They were, with, you know, they were without excuse. They could have known, they should have known, but they didn't know. And Peter verified that when he's preaching to the Jews in Acts 3. He said, you did it through ignorance. So God gave them an opportunity. In Acts chapter 3, verse seven, number 17, And now, brethren, Peter's preaching to Israel, And now, brethren, I walk that through ignorance. You did it as did also your rulers. But those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all his prophets, that Christ should suffer, he hath so fulfilled... Repent ye therefore. Who's the ye? Israel. Repent ye therefore. Be converted that your sins may be blotted out. When will that happen? When the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Second coming of Christ, setting up the kingdom. Israel as a nation is saved and put under a new covenant. He said, And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. The restitution has to do with restoring again the kingdom to Israel, as in Acts 1, verse 6. He said that this was spoken by all his holy prophets since the world began. They have an opportunity in early Acts to repent, no doubt about it. Between his resurrection and his public ascension 40 days later, Christ made appearances to his disciples, opening the scriptures uh, to their understanding, explaining how that he had to suffer, but now that the kingdom will come, uh, there had to be the suffering and now the glory. They had a hard time. They didn't understand the cross uh, leading up to it. They, when Christ said something, at the, he didn't even say something to them about the cross till the end of his ministry, and they didn't believe it. They didn't get it. Uh, they, they, were, they did not get it, but when he rose from the dead, he opened their understanding, showed them how this must be, and that the glory will come. But he's still not talking about the mystery of the body of Christ yet. Look in Acts chapter 1. In Acts chapter 1, verse 1, The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. So the book of Acts is the continuation of his earthly ministry, but it's through the Holy Ghost and the Apostles. Until the day in which he was taken up after he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, You have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence, when they therefore were come together. So on the basis of what Christ had been teaching them, what was their obvious question? They asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? See, that's still the issue in the early Acts. People say, the commentators say, well, this was a dumb question. Uh, they were off track. No, 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 no. See, Jesus taught them. And if this was the wrong question, that would mean he failed as a teacher. And he didn't fail. They knew exactly what they were asking. And Christ didn't rebuke them for asking the question. He simply said, it's not for you to know the times of the seasons, which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. 
that was prophesied. They would, they would be baptized with the Holy Ghost through the signs and wonders of the kingdom. That's not happening today. That's not the same thing as being baptized by one spirit and one body. Not at all. He said, the Holy Ghost come upon you. You should be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea, all Judea and in Samaria and in the most part of the earth. And so they begin in Jerusalem because that's the capital of the kingdom. If Jerusalem doesn't repent, there's no need to go any further. Okay, and we'll talk about that issue in another study. There's some things I'd like to discuss about that, but we're about out of time. But the thing is, this is the kingdom here. No doubt about it. They had an offer of the kingdom. Now, in accordance with prophecy, 10 days later on the Jewish feast day of Pentecost, when Jews of the dispersion had gathered in Jerusalem, Christ baptized the apostles with the Holy Ghost for power in Acts 2, and they preached the gospel of the kingdom to Israel with great signs and wonders. And uh, that, that's something different. That, that baptism with the Holy Ghost, I can't emphasize enough, that's not the same thing as what Paul talked about when he said, by one spirit we're baptized into one body. Christ pouring out the Holy Ghost on his disciples for power is not the same thing as the Spirit baptizing in us, us into Christ for salvation. One was prophesied, one was a mystery. So Peter was preaching about things spoken of the prophets since the world began. The leaders in Jerusalem stubbornly continued to reject Christ. And in Acts 7, they stoned a man that they knew were filled. He, they knew Stephen was filled with the Holy Ghost. In Acts 7, his face shone as an angel. Uh, they couldn't resist the words that he spoke. But instead of repenting, they killed him. They stoned him. Strike three. You see, they rejected the Father. They rejected the Son. And in the book of Acts, they rejected the Holy Ghost. And according to prophecy, the tribulation could have begun. That's why Stephen said, I see the Son of Man standing at the right hand. Son of Man's a messianic title concerning uh, Christ as King coming back in judgment. He was standing. And the Bible says in Psalm 110, uh, sit at my right hand. The Father said to the Son, sit at my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. And so the fact that he was standing would, would signify to them he was about to come back in judgment. Israel fell in Acts 7. And they were diminished in Acts 8 through 28 as far as a transition period that's recorded in the book of Acts. They're set aside officially in blindness as a nation in Acts 28, but they fell in Acts 7. Instead of pouring out wrath, God poured out exceeding abundant grace. You know what happened in Acts 9. He saved the leader of the rebellion against him, Saul of Tarsus, and made him the apostle to the Gentiles, giving him revelations of a new dispensation the dispensation of the grace of God. Paul said in 1 Timothy 1 that when he was saved, he became a pattern uh, and that something happened in him first. Something happened in him first. See, God could have poured out wrath. He could have brought judgment, but he poured out grace, saved Paul, made him the apostle to the Gentiles. And so in this age, God is building one spiritual body with a heavenly position. We're blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Uh, Christ gave Paul the, the gospel, the grace of God, the revelation, the mystery, and other doctrines that go along with the uniqueness of this age. And Paul's ministry was actually the ministry of Christ from heaven. And it concerns the things that were kept secret since the world began. Romans 16, 25. In Colossians 1, he talks about his ministry uh, as far as to the Gentiles with the mystery. He said Christ was working in him mightily. Well, after this parenthetical age ends with the mystery of the rapture, God will resume his dealings with Israel, bring them through tribulation, and set up his kingdom just like he promised. Put him, he'll put them under a new covenant, and he will literally fulfill all his promises he made to her. One Christ, two distinct ministries, his earthly ministry, his heavenly. Uh, I appreciate you joining us. I hope you'll join us again next time.